And now to our Chasing the Dream initiative on poverty and opportunity in America. Kevin Powell grew up so poor that he still has nightmares of the roach and rat infested places in which he lived. And while you may know him from season one of MTV's groundbreaking series, The Real World, you may not know that his path to celebrity has not been easy. In fact, it's been paid with a legacy of poverty, self-loathing, and violence that has led him to become a successful author, journalist, and political activist. Now he's using that platform to tell the world about his harrowing childhood in a new autobiography titled The Education of Kevin Powell. Kevin Powell joins us now. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Kevin, in the acknowledgments to this book, your memoir, you write that without question, the hardest thing you've ever written has been this, even though you've written 12 books. Why was this so unusually difficult for you? It's like, uh, it was like self-therapy. When you write an autobiography, a memoir, you have to go back and recount every aspect of your life. I'm literally going from age three, which is the age that I am on the cover, to my late yeah. 40s where I'm at now. And I had to go back to the poverty you described, the violence, the abuse, the abandonment of my father when I was eight years old, um, you know, being brutalized by a police officer when I was 15 years old. And it's, it's not easy to recount aspects of your life. I've written about it in different places in the past, in my poetry, in blogs, et cetera, but to have to bring it all together, it, 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 was, it was painful. I even had nightmares writing the book, yeah. but uh, the responses have been so incredible from a very diverse group of people around the country and even internationally that it was worth the, worth the effort over the course of four or five years of writing this thing. Can you give us a brief example of some of the reaction that you've gotten? Oh my gosh, I've gotten reactions from people around America, black, white, Latino, Asian, people in South Africa, uh, people in Brazil. Uh, it's a lot of single mothers, because I was raised by a single mother, are responding to the book. Uh, an elite boys' school in Connecticut have have adapted the book for the entire school. Really? So wow. those kind of things are happening. So so talk about your situation growing up, Kevin. Yes, I know it's difficult, but share it with our audience. Paint a picture of, of just how how difficult it was to to grow up as a poor black kid in Jersey City. Well, you know, I think about it now. When Dr. King was uh, uh, at the end of his life, he was organizing a poor people's campaign in this country because he said, what does it matter that you can sit anywhere on the bus if you have no money to get on the bus? You know, what does it matter you can sit at the lunch counter if you have no money to buy a sandwich? <laughs> and I didn't realize he was talking about people like me and my mom. When I talk about poverty, uh, she and I shared a bed in the bedroom, and my Aunt Kathy and my cousin Anthony, who was three days older than me, shared a bed in the living room, a one-bedroom apartment, two mothers and two sons, wow. the first eight or nine years of my life. No uh, telephone, uh, black and white TV. I would go to my friends' homes and think that something was wrong with their TV because it was color, <laughs> you know? And I had one pair of shoes, one pair of sneakers, and if you ran a hole into those shoes or sneakers, you had to put cardboard or some newspaper at the bottom of the shoes, even in, in the winter time. And so when people look at me now and they say, well, I see you on TV, I see the books, I'm like, you have no idea the circumstances that produced me because it was, it was difficult. Uh, and it, it's not just my reality, but it's a reality for a lot of poor people in this country, which is why, you know, when I hear people disrespect, you know, poor white brothers and sisters or immigrants or other folks who are just trying to make something with their lives, I empathize because I'm like, that's me as well. Right, right. And the violence that surrounded you. I mean, you yeah. start the book yeah. with a vignette about getting pummeled. Oh, yeah. I was some uh, of your neighbors. in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, uh, and I love I love my urban environment. But, uh, you know, I was a young man. I didn't say specifically it was Newark, but it was Newark, New Jersey. And I got jumped. And I thought I was going to get killed that yeah. day. Yeah. Because the other thing about growing up in a poor environment, an urban environment, is that you're living this very precarious existence. And so I was one of those little kids, like a lot of black and Latino boys. Will I make it to 15? Will I make it to 18? Will I make it to 21? Will I ever see 30 years of age? And so I purposely wanted to start with something that was very jarring, but also kind of set the tone for the kind of experiences that people would read in the book. So what saved you? What got you out of that world? And what prevented you from an early death, from a violent future, and perhaps from incarceration, as so many of you of your, of your neighbors and your brothers Three things, Experience. three things saved my life. Faith, you know, just believing in something greater than ourselves. My mother always taught me to believe. Uh, my mother had a vision. My mother only has a grade school education, you know, but from the time I was three or four years old, she said, you're going to college, you're going to college. My mother, who only reads passages from the Bible, reads the local newspaper, watches the local news, but she never read a book, never set foot on a college campus, but somewhere in her, because she's a product of the boomer generation, the civil rights generation, she caught the spirit of that movement and she understood the third thing was, my son has got to get an education. He has got to go further in school than I do. And even in spite of all the complicated love that I talk about between my mother and I, yeah. You see, right when I'm three, four years old in the book, she's teaching me how to read, how to count. And those things began the process of a lifelong love of learning. But as you say, it was a complicated relationship. I mean, she was tough. Oh, hard. yeah. I mean, she, she didn't shy away from hitting you and hitting you hard. 
Yeah, it, it was difficult. And that was probably one of the most difficult things for me to write in the book was just to recount that because I wanted to make it clear. People said to me, well, are you describing, you know, child abuse? And I said, you know what, would I raise my children like that? No, you know, I would, I feel like I've evolved past where my mother was. She did the best she could as a single black woman. She had to deal with racism, sexism, and classism, you know, in the society. She was born in the Jim Crow South in the 1940s. And so people talk about abuse. Well, the world that she she grew up in, she was abused as a young woman of color. So what were the long-lasting effects of growing up poor and in that kind of environment with the violence, et cetera, uh, effects that lasted beyond oh, yeah. the point where you became a successful man? Well, you, you grew up angry, you know. I, it's funny, because I work with a lot of young people today around the country, and especially a lot of young males, all different backgrounds, not just black kids or black, black and Latino kids. I ask them, you know, they always, how many have anger problems? They raise their hands, you know, because they have these conflictual relationships with their parents. And I think that it's really important for, for boys to be taught early on, just how we teach girls to be expressive, you know, to understand it's okay to cry, to say what you feel, and to feel that they're in spaces where they can, they can, they can be the full totality of what masculinity is. Otherwise, you grow up a walking time bomb the way I was. And so in spite of successes, as you put it, I still was acting out. I still was engaging yeah, you, you in disruptive behavior. You got kicked behavior. out of Rutgers? I got kicked out of college, you know. In, in, in the real world, you had some problems. There was arguments in the real world. This is not <laughs> physical argument, physical violence, but there was arguments. And so, you know, at the time, I didn't understand the difference between proactive anger and reactionary anger. Reactionary anger is destructive. It hurts you and it hurts the people around you. Proactive anger is you turn that into, you know, something that can be a, you be a bridge builder, you know. How'd you, you learn this? Years of therapy, years of counseling, yoga, meditation, yeah. you know, things that I'm a big uh, proponent of now that I wish I was there for me as a child, as a teenager, as yeah. a young man. You know, a lot of times, you know, we just are thrown out there and you're trying to figure it out. You see what a lot of our celebrities out there, you know, you know, the Justin Bieber's, the Tupac Shakur's, yeah. you know, who've gotten into trouble, you know, but it's like, there's no one saying to them. We just see them, you know, just like me. I was in the real world and in my 20s, the next thing I'm writing cover stories for Quincy Jones' Vibe magazine, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm still a young man, and there's nothing that prepares you for any of that, and now you have a very public space where you're literally acting out all of the stuff that you were carrying around since you were a child, pain and trauma. So what are the lessons that you hope to convey yes, sir. To, to black kids, Latino kids who yeah. live now in the same kind of poverty and difficulties that you grew up in? Well, one, anything is possible if you really find what you're passionate about. You know, my mother took me to the library when I was eight years old, and three years later, I discovered Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, as I talk about in the book. And I remember saying to myself, this book is amazing. Uh, uh, I love um, um, Spanish since I was a child because of PBS, actually, mm -hmm. growing up on Sesame Street and Electric Company, learning words in English and Spanish. And I remember going back and studying who Ernest Hemingway was, and I said, wow, if this is what a writer does, this exciting life, then I want to be a writer. So young people should find their passion, um, and you got to understand that no matter what your circumstances, you know. But what you, if they don't have a mother like you did? Oh my God, you've got to find it in yourself. You've got to find a mentor. You've got to find a role model. You've got to find someone. And I didn't have a father, so I would study men on TV like yourself. Huh. I would look at how you were dressed, how you wore your suit, things like that. I would look at how people spoke. And so I studied men from different angles. And then I discovered, found men that I could admire in books, you know, hmm. Malcolm X, Perry Thomas is down these mean trees. Whatever it was, I had to find it, you know what I mean? Because I, I was determined not to be stuck, which is the thing I keep saying in this memoir, I could not be stuck because I knew there was something better for me out there. And very quickly, what's the lesson for the rest of us who didn't grow up as you did? The lesson for the rest of us is have empathy and compassion for people no matter where they come from. You know, love all people and take the time to learn who they are. You know, I don't care if they're black or white, Latino, Asian, straight or gay, poor or wealthy. You know, let's have compassion for each other's sisters and brothers. All right, well, Kevin, thank you so much. Thank it's you so much, sir. To you. Thank you, sir.